Hello everyone. Welcome to the third lecture of this week. So today we will be discussing about how do we achieve sustainability through design. So we will discuss this through some examples and along with that we will try to understand what that particular example implies in terms of design for sustainability. So example one uh, is about pet bottles converted to jeans. So Levis came up with this idea that to tackle waste they wanted to create denim an entire denim range so they came up with the jacket as well as the trousers that you can see in this photograph which can be made with one trouser is made with eight plastic bottles the drinking water bottles why this kind of a decision because at the time when uh, this uh, project started uh, global bottle water consumption was more than 29 liters per person per year so you can imagine the amount of uh, pet bottles so the plastic bottle the transparent part of it is made up of a plastic which is called pet pet uh, polyethylene terephthalate the cap is made up of another uh, plastic that is polypropylene so we are talking about the body of the plastic transparent uh, bottles Recycling rates were are as low as 29% in US, 51% in Euro for those bottles at the time the project started. So it made quite a lot of sense that let's reuse the pet bottles which is otherwise going into landfills and ending up in our oceans into clothes. So but doing that was directly not very easy. One has to do design interventions to achieve the same. So the design interventions which were done was firstly research and development was done to identify how do we spin this new fiber from these waste plastics. The line was called as waste less line. Then plastic bottles and food trays which are made of uh, pet are supposed to be collected from municipal sites. They need to be cleaned. Then they need to be sorted into different colors or on other bases. Then they need to be crushed into flakes and made into a polyester fiber using the research and development that they did for finding out a technique for fiber spinning out of the waste materials. So you can see that uh, Levis had also to figure out how do they do this collection from municipal sites. They also had to bring in a Mm, setup which can clean, sort and crush the flakes, another setup which can make the polyester fiber out of them. Then this uh, polyester fiber will be blended with cotton fiber which is finally woven with traditional cotton yarn to create the denim. The look and feel seems no different to traditional denim but if you look into the jeans from the inside part it might have different color streaks which are because of the fact that we use colored plastic uh, bottles so the impression of the color is only on the back side of the garment and not on the visible side of the garment so you might say hues of brown green or it might be clear in color uh, the company, uh, when this report was written by Guardian, that was uh, spring 2013, the company had already reused more than 3.6 million bottles and food trays and converted them into around 300,000 wasteless jeans and jackets. These could have otherwise ended up in a landfill or they would have been burnt or they would have ended up in our oceans. So you can see that uh, design intervention, intervention in terms of development of new technologies for fiber spinning, n development of new systems in which you s set up a collection system to collect the waste trays and the food, new business, uh, new factory units or new machinery units which can clean, sort, crush them into flakes and convert them into polyester fiber. Then uh, advertising strategy so that the message is conveyed on to people that this 
is a very innovative uh, jeans it's very environmental friendly but at the same time it is equally comfortable and nice looking or looks similar to traditional denim so this is an interesting example of how can we bring in sustainability using design design into multiple phases of product development and reaching the product to the market let's go to the next example uh, you might have seen a vortex vortex is nothing but a spiraling movement of a liquid so the first image shows you how it from a top view of that spiral and the second image shows you a side view of the vortex so all of us know that the shortest distance between a point a to point b is a straight line which connects point a to point b but not necessarily that is the lowest energy path so if you observe water water always tries to travel in vortex because vortex is the lowest energy path now we're talking about uh, this particular example so what does happen when we use you know, vortex technology so vortex because of the way because of the spiraling motion of the uh, liquid it pumps out air from the pumps out the air from the water into the atmosphere in the absence of uh, air in air bubbles in water microorganisms cannot grow in it so this technique can be used for cleaning water this uh, particular example that i am showing it comes from a book called the blue economy the we will shortly discuss about the principles of blue economy uh, but to give you a gist what blue economy suggests is that you pick a physical phenomenon identify an appropriate business model where you can put it and then you get a sustainable solution so in this case we know that naturally uh, uh, vortex helps rivers to stay clean clean from microorganisms and as a result foul smell and so on which you will not found, find in a standing in a water body like a pond which becomes really smelly after a point of time and needs constant cleaning whereas for rivers we do not need to keep on cleaning it for biological matter because the vortex helps to clean it now imagine will you uh, like to use this vortex based cleaning mechanism in for your water filtration at home maybe not because now we have got so much more used to uh, water purifiers using uv treatment ro treatment and uh, psychologically it becomes very difficult to accept something which is vortex uh, based so maybe that is not the most useful business case study so what can be a more useful business case study is so i will first play a video which is uh, by the author of this book uh, gonter polly and then i will take you through a journey of very innovative business cases in which this vortex mechanism of getting water rid of air uh, can be used Have you ever wondered how rivers cleanse themselves? Whenever there is too much dirt in water, somehow it turns clean downstream. Scientists have been puzzled for a long time. The Swedish development engineer and entrepreneur Kurt Halberg and his colleague Morten Oversen studied water movements and realized what others had observed. Water never moves in a straight line. Water swirls. Water knows a straight line may be the shortest distance between two points, but a swirl covers that same distance faster, with less effort. The Austrian scientist Victor Schauberger explained how this movement known as the vortex presses air out of water, and how the same can squeeze air back into the water. We all have observed this, water swirls the flushing toilet and empties the bathtub. Remember seeing it? If there is no air in the water, then there is no dissolved oxygen. Then bacteria cannot survive. However, 
When air is abundant, then bacteria flourish. The continuous shift from full to pour in air leads to the self-cleansing of water. The only source of energy to make this work is gravity. Kurt imagined the mathematical model underpinning the swirling movement and Morton molded this into a physical structure that creates a vortex. What Rico, their startup company in Sweden, makes machines that generate the vortex to freeze water faster and cheaper, to replace chemicals that kill bacteria, and to permit a higher advertising revenue since crystal clear eyes does not crack, maintaining publicity visible all the time. This innovation saves energy, eliminates costly chemicals, and increases advertising income. These are just some of the opportunities ready for the market near you. So as you saw in this video, Gontrapoli explains to you how the vortex works and how the machine was developed. And so you heard in the video how Gaunter Pauli explained to you the physical phenomenon of vortex and its effect on water. So once the machine was developed, uh, the um, uh, engineer started trying to um, think where we can place it so that we can get appropriate cash flow. So the first application that was found out was in making crystal clear eyes. Since the vortex machine helps to generate crystal clear ice which happens because of the fact that mm, air is expelled out the dissolved air is expelled out so you do not get those very very tiny bubbles of air inside mm, ice which might mm, which are disrupting the mm, visual look of the ice now this ice is not supposed to be used for mm, putting in our drinks or for such an mm, such purposes this particular ice is meant to be used in applications like ice hockey so uh, what happens in an ice hockey rink is of course it happens on top of a uh, ice float the advertising is below that so now because my ice is crystal clear I can uh, get better visibility of the uh, uh, advertising also, the ice remains crystal clear throughout the season, thus increasing the revenues coming from publicity. Also, since air, all of us know air is a good insulator, so I need to pump in more energy and time to cool down the water into ice. Because I am removing the air before cooling it down into ice, I need to spend lesser amount of energy and time to make ice. Also, it is observed that air-free ice also cracks less readily. Another advantage is since there is no air bubbles, very dangerous bacteria like E. coli and Salmonella which grow in, in icy environments, they can no longer grow. So, no requirement of treatment of the water with chemicals to prevent their growth. Also, the ice is safe for a very very long period of usage. Next cash flow. The next usage identified was in the golf courses. So a golf course may use may need up to 1 million gallons of water a day. Just imagine the volume of water. So currently what is being done is to save water. Surfactants which are chemicals are added to the water so that the water penetrates faster into the lawn and it also evaporates less. Now this is a chemical process, surfactants are chemicals. But it was observed that when water treated by the vortex machine is used for watering these lawns, no chemicals are needed and it reduces the requirement of water by 20 to 30 percent. Next cash flow. Again because it removes air which means no dissolved oxygen no microbial growth so it can also keep algae away from stable water bodies so stable water bodies like swimming pools 
which otherwise use uh, chemicals like chlorine which is damaging to the environment also damaging to the human beings who want to swim in that swimming pool they can be kept free from algae if vortex machine is used to uh, clean the water fourth cash flow in the treatment of salt water plants so reverse osmosis is a process used for converting uh, salt water into drinkable water it is observed that uh, on the membrane of the reverse osmosis uh, plant uh, biofilm starts developing which is very obvious because of the air content and the microbial content of the ex of the water which is flowing through it so every fortnight the whole plant needs to be stopped and the biofilm needs to be uh, cleaned it's a time consuming process as well as the cleaning is a chemical process so they placed a vortex uh, machine before the membrane and passed the water through this vortex machine as a result of it since the water doesn't have any microbial content into it biofilm formation was stopped so you can see it uh, saves a lot of time which is required for cleaning or regular cleaning of the membrane along with that the chemical process could be eliminated we can identify more interesting cash flows from this so you can see in order to achieve a sustainable so sustainability how does it bring in social sustainability because these are very small business and job generating activities the cash flows so as a result social sustainability can come in and these are these science principles and the machines are left open source so that anybody interested in developing something of this kind can take it up and develop it in the application they would like to have it and environmental sustainability and economic sustainability you can already see it does save lot of money it also helps in earning lot of money lot of chemicals can be eliminated from the processes so the principle of blue economy the book goes by the title the blue economy 10 years 100 innovations 100 million jobs it is written by gonter poli it proposes that a blue economy business model will shift society from scarcity to abundance with what we have by taking issues that cause environmental related by tackling issues that cause environmental related problems in new ways what are the new ways it is by connecting and combining seemingly disparate environmental problems with open source scientific solutions which are based upon physical processes common in the natural world so rather than uh, focusing on using rare and high energy cost resources we refocus to seek solutions based upon simpler and cleaner technologies and we inspire entrepreneurs to adopt these insights and come up with new business models so the open source technology helps many entrepreneurs also to adopt its insights and take it into any business model that they think will be useful i will show you two more examples which will make the principle more clear to you if you the book it contains 100 innovations now the bank has been grown further and it is at the moment 112 innovations all open source you can if you are interested in knowing more about them you can go to this particular website and read through um, some of those innovations each innovation is described in 2 to 3 pages have you ever wondered why there are flies whenever there is dirt flies are abundant Many are convinced flies are a source of diseases. Some think differently. The Nigerian social entrepreneur and priest Godfrey Ndamujo observed flies and realized that they eat rotting leftovers. When food is rich, they quickly lay eggs and before long, maggots proliferate. Maggots are rich in protein and a favorite of fish and birds. 
The British scientist Stephen Britland studied the age-old successful tradition to treat open wounds with maggots and offered it solid signs. While we have heard about it, few of us fancy the idea of having maggots around. How do you feel about it? Father Zemujo created a special zone at the Songhai Center in Porto Novo, Benin, where all slaughterhouse waste is offered to flies under strict conditions. He calls it the Maggot Hotel. Maggots fed to fish and quails, cutting costs, generating food. This system offers a breakthrough for Stephen Britland, who created advanced gel technologies in Bradford by Leeds. The US and British governments have approved wound treatment by maggots, but costs remain high. However, when maggots are made to vomit, simply throwing them into salt water, then the enzymes can be collected, purified and sterilized at a fraction of costs. This innovation converts waste into a quality product, substitutes antibiotics and increases income while generating jobs, providing health care at low costs and relieves patients of the sight of crawling maggots on their limbs. These are opportunities for entrepreneurs around the world. So in this video, Gontri Polly is talking about a technique of treating wounds in which live maggots can be left on the wound and they eat away the microorganisms and help to treat the open wounds much faster. That is a very expensive process and it's also not very great to see maggots crawling around. Uh, open wound. So the technique uh, that uh, they developed is take the waste away from uh, the place where a community is living, put it into a uh, separate place far away from the community. All the flies will be attracted to that particular place. Now the human settlement stays away from flies which means away from diseases. The flies when they are eating all the biological waste they consume all the biological waste as, and they give they lay eggs which hatch soon into maggots. These maggots can then be put into uh, hot salt water. They vomit out the enzymes which is required for treatment of the open wounds and the maggots can then be used as fish feed. So multiple um, economic channels coming out from uh, food waste or other kinds of biological waste which were till date a big source of problem. I had to always go into a landfill or we had to think about how do we compose it which is also a great idea to deal with it. But this is a very inexpensive and very uh, effective solution brings in multiple ways of earning money. Have you ever wondered how much coffee from the farm actually ends up in your cup? From the biomass harvested at a farm in Colombia or Zimbabwe, only 0.2% is ingested. The rest is simply left to rot. The Chinese scientist Xu Ting Chan demonstrated in his lab in Hong Kong that coffee serves as an ideal substrate for farming mushrooms. The Colombian researcher turned entrepreneur Carmenza Jaramillo documented in over 20 articles that coffee is not only an ideal substrate for tropical mushrooms, it generates jobs, income and food security. Chida Govero from Zimbabwe, an orphan who lost her mother at the age of seven, turned into a whiz at farming mushrooms. She became the head of a small family nucleus, including her little brother and near-blind grandmother and went on to demonstrate, in spite of abuse and poverty, that an export crop like coffee could provide food security in Africa. Does this seem like a new business model in the making? When Chido and Carmenza visited California in 2009, a couple of graduates from Berkeley University listened to the projects in Latin America and Africa and concluded 
concluded that they could collect the coffee waste from the coffee shops and grow mushrooms in the inner city, providing competitive and high quality food while generating jobs. Alex and Mikkel have proven their business model and are hiring staff. Wherever in the world people farm or drink coffee, in the city or countryside, waste pulp can be converted to protein. There are 25 million coffee farms in over 50 countries and 100,000 coffee shops everywhere. We are talking about the potential to generate 50 million jobs, creating quality food out of something that had no value. What are you setting up the business? So from all these three examples that you can see, the design philosophy of uh, Blue Economy says that take a physical phenomenon from the net nature, identify appropriate uh, business models where it can be used, replace, this will in turn replace use of harmful chemicals, will reduce wastages and also generate um, income and jobs because of the new channelization of uh, the waste or uh, reduction in the use of chemicals. So this is another approach for sustainability. So if you compare the first approach which was converting the pet bottles into uh, garments and the second approach identify different physical phenomena and convert them into appropriate business uh, models to achieve sustainability. You can't say that example one was absolutely one technique which can be used in every ways. You cannot say the mm, second method, the blue economy method is one uh, technique which can be used in all contexts. So depending on different contexts, we have to apply design fundamentals in different manners. Design has to come up in, in different parts of the value chain of a product and at different life cycles. We will see more examples. Austria is world champion in paper recycling. Already 9 out of 10 newspapers and 9 out of 10 cardboard boxes are made from recycled paper. Which is great because it shows how many people here are ready to do something to protect the environment. What most people don't know, however, is that even in the recycling process, lots of resources are still lost. Because only the pulp can really be recycled, which is about 60% of the total volume. Up to 40%, mainly ink and filler material, is separated from the pulp and is left over after the recycling process as more or less poisonous sludge. This poses the question whether it's really environmentally friendly when, of any product, only 60% is really suited to recycling. Since the beginning of the industrial age, we produce things which end their lifespan on a rubbish dump. The motto is take, make, waste. But if more and more people use more and more products, then eventually we will run out of the raw materials needed to make new products. Already today, we consume more resources each year than the Earth can regenerate. So simply consume less? Unfortunately, no. In that way, we can at the most delay the depletion of our resources, not prevent it. We would then only be driving more slowly, but still in the wrong direction. It's about taking the right turn, because damaging behavior patterns do not become positive or useful if one does them less. But that is exactly what the issue is today, to design products so that they are useful and not merely less damaging. The most beautiful examples of this are provided by nature. A cherry tree produces endless blossoms. Once the cherry blossom season is over, the petals fall to the ground, where they do not become rubbish heaps but flow back as nutriment into the cycle of nature. All resources remain intact and can be used again and again. The cradle-to-cradle -cradle design principle works exactly the same way. The goal is to lead more and more materials into cycles. For this, products must be conceived from the start in such a way that at the end of their life cycles, they can flow back into biological or technical cycles. In the meantime, many products have been reinvented specifically for this. From televisions to sofa covers and carpets, 
to shampoo, t-shirts and toilet paper. New to this circle are cradle-to-cradle -cradle printing products, for which all constituent materials have been examined for environmental or health risk factors and, if necessary, replaced. And now, paper, inks and additional materials are manufactured so that complete recycling is finally possible. Now, not just the pulp can return to the cycle. In the future, even the sewage sludge may be used as fertilizer or for humus generation. And if this humus does not go straight onto a farmer's field, then maybe the trees will grow from it, which will then provide pulp for new paper. Cradle-to-cradle -cradle printing products could even be directly composted, and when burnt, the ash is good for the vegetable garden. With cradle-to-cradle, -cradle, we can close the cycle. And now, with Googler, you too can print as nature would print. Off we go. Let's make an end to the destruction of resources. Let's begin the next printing revolution together. So in this video you come across a new terminology called cradle to cradle. So what is cradle to cradle? It is a biomimetic approach to design of systems. What do we mean by biomimetic approach is you mimic how the biological world works. How does the biological world works? So nothing is a waste in our biological world. We have everything cycling. So a tree takes its nutrients from the soil. When the leaves of the tree or flowers or other parts of it which are decomposable falls onto the soil they return back the nutrients to the soil and these keeps on happening in a cycle uh, you might have uh, read about carbon cycle and nitrogen cycle and oxygen cycle in uh, your school so biomimetic approach means design systems in the way nature designs it so that everything goes in a biological cycle now Say plastic cannot go in a biological cycle. So mm, taking inspiration from nature, we develop two cycles in cradle to cradle. Part one is the biological cycle. So you can see over here the biological cycle and part two is the technical cycle. What it implies is uh, your product might be made up of couple of components. The components which can go in a biological cycle that is they can decompose like can you see decompose they can after the end of life they can go into a biological cycle if the say for example paper paper can decompose so it can go into a biological cycle but we can also recycle paper so at that point of time so you can see i have an option over here that i can either take it back into my technical cycle or if it is no longer recyclable so say a paper can be recycled maximum up to six times after which the cellulose chains become very tiny so you cannot make good paper out of it so in that particular case uh, the paper which is no longer recyclable can go to the decomposition cycle which is the biological cycle in case it can be used back it can again go back into the technical cycle. When we look at this in this particular cycle, plastics are not actually mm, very bad because what we can do is we can collect back the plastics which implies we have to have a collection system, mm, sort them out, grind them out and again reuse them. So which means it keeps on going into the technical cycle again and again. Same happens with metal. So say aluminum needs to be retrieved back and again go into the cycle. What cradle to cradle also adds upon it is while doing this whole process we should use 100% renewable energy which might come from solar energy, wind energy, tidal energy. Then it also em emphasizes water stewardship clean water output which means the factory whichever is making these products they should ensure that they minimize on the consumption of water as well as the water which is released out of its uh, 
factory premises is clean water. The third one is social responsibility. So the community, it should have a positive impact on the community with respect to social aspects of the community. Then fourth one is material reutilization, recyclability and compostability. So not only that uh, you make the product out of a particular material which is recyclable or uh, compostable, you have to also put in place systems that you can collect back those materials or you can enable your consumers so that they can themselves do the recycling or composting. Uh, the fifth one talks about material health impact on human and environment. So it also as a very important criteria it also mandates that a product should be made up of components or uh, a product's component should be made up of materials which do not have any hazardous impact on the human and the um, environment. What it means is say for example some uh, paints they might have a effect of leaching some chemicals or say some plastics they are not food grade but if those plastics are used for making toys for babies babies will automatically put the toy into their mouth and the um, toy is not food grade so it can leach chemicals into the baby's mouth so it ensures that a person who wants to go for cradle to cradle certification should also ensure that his product is made up of materials which has no negative impact on human and environmental health. So I will show you one example. In this particular example, this is an example from the uh, fabric industry. So you can see my fabric grows as a result of photosynthesis done by plants. So this might be cotton say for example. Then I have to ensure because as I told you, I should not be use any kind of material which has a Im bad impact on the human and the environment. So a big no no to nutrients which are based on uh, chemical pesticides and herbicides. But any kind of nutrients which is a natural nutrient or an organic nutrient can be used for growing these plants. These can be this then go into polymer production process which again goes into fiber extrusion. Thereafter, what I get is organic fiber products or biodegradable products. These products can be directly used and after usage, they can go into decomposition phase. But say for example, if I want to combine it with my pet bottles and create denim or uh, there are also fabric because of the kind of requirement from technical requirement from the fabric. I might need to mix other raw materials which are synthetic raw materials. So then my organic materials enter into the technical cycle where I add the synthetic fabrics as well as metals. So metal in the sense like zippers, uh, plastic uh, buttons or metal buttons and uh, other decorative items. Mm, again dyes and bleaches which are chemical based is again a no-no because they are toxic to the environment and to human beings. So we are supposed to use natural dyes and non-harmful, non-toxic dyes. Then we add on to rivets, buttons and zippers as per requirement or any other decorations. Finally, my garment will be manufactured in the manufacturing unit. I have to take care of the fact that all these processes happen using renewable energy, I optimize on to water usage as well as I ensure that the water leaving out my premises is clean water. Finally, I get my products and garments. A part of these products and garments after usage can go into the biodegradable waste chain because it can be biodegraded and rest of the components like the buttons, the zippers or even the synthetic materials which has been added to it should go back into the technical cycle. Me as a manufacturer will also have to ensure that I devise a entire mechanism in the marketplace where I enable my consumers so that they can do the biodegradable activities or the technical re uh, recycling activities. 
so cradle to cradle tries to achieve sustainability by uh, mimicking uh, natural processes of uh, things going in a biological cycle in a biological cycle or things going in a technical cycle uh, it also has a certification process and when you design products you uh, can get certified by cradle to cradle to know more about the process the um, author of the book on cradle to cradle has a ted talk so you can go through his ted talk you can also read the book on cradle to um, cradle for more information and inspiration on those lines now coming to another approach for uh, design for sustainability so this is an example from a company called kluber lubricant services so kluber Uh, they sell lubricants to commercial customers commercial com customers in the sense um, industries and factories so lubricants are required for their um, machines so these are high end lubricants so earlier their business was to sell lubricants so they came up with a new idea lubricants are a big source of uh, chemical hazard when industries are using lubricants because me as a industry i might not be an expert in knowing when my lubricant needs to be changed i might either change it before its expiry period or i might change it after its expiry period if i'm changing before it is uh, its functional life is over then i'm wasting precious resource if i as well as my own money if i do it after the time frame i am causing more wear and tear to my machine which also might mean that my machine is consuming more energy and i am spending more money in repair of my machines because me as an industry i do not have expertise in lubricant management it might be also very expensive for me to hire a full time lubricant specialized engineer to manage that for my industry so they came up with this idea and uh, it's a service plus uh, is the called as sate kluber so what this uh, service does is they analyze the effectiveness of aerosol treatment plants and sewage treatment plants they designed a movable chemical laboratory which is mounted in a van this van goes to the industries which have subscribed for the lubricant plus the service does constant monitoring of their machines and the lubricant over there Uh, determine the performance of the lubricants and their environmental impact in, uh, in location and it uh, after doing the test it determines whether it is the right time to change the lubricant or not they also have additional services like they also try to see that there is noise control vibration control smoke control and any other uh, undesirable industrial impacts after bringing in this service they observe that no their sale of lubricants reduced but that does not mean their income reduced their income increased because of the service part of it the industries the clients became very very happy because they clearly could see increase in terms of efficiency guarantee of functionality durability and it also enhances environmental uh, protection which is a plus point for the industries because they have to uh, generate environmental reports at the end of each year uh, so now it became in the interest of the client as well as kluber to be more and more sustainable why because kluber if they do a better job in good lubricant management and reducing the environmental impact and other undesirable impact in the client's location they are able to make more money out of the service aspect of it they sell less lubricants that is the environmental benefit it is in their economic interest to be environmentally friendly they will be also more encouraged to make better and better lubricants for a longer life which means uh, their service will be even more valuable than in that case for the clients for the industries it's again a very very win win situation because they do not uh, they are ensured of the efficiency they know now they have to spend less time on maintenance of their machines there is someone else to do it who is more specialized into doing it they are releasing less environmentally damaging effects which is a plus point in their 
annual audit report. So it's in the economic interest of all um, stakeholders involved to be environment friendly in this case. So this can be another approach to design where it is in the economic interest of the stakeholder to go into more and more sustainable processes. Now coming to an example which is closer to home, India. So this is called as provision of urban amenities in rural areas, short form Pura. So it was a framework envisioned by President of India. The example that I would show you dates back to way much before time that uh, it's called as a Varna uh, Pura. Varna Pura um, started its activities in uh, the late 1930s. Uh, so uh, this uh, framework was envisioned by the President of uh, India, late Dr. Abdul uh, Kalam, in his book, Target 3 Billion. So what it envisions is to improve the quality of life and bridge the urban-rural divide is the next calling for us in order to achieve sustainability. Why it will give sustainability is when the divide between urban and rural is reduced, there will be lesser migration of people from rural areas to urban areas, reducing stress on the urban environment on the requirement of resources. It will also ensure better distribution of population, better distribution of different economic activities with more and more people migrating away from rural areas. Your people in the agriculture sector, the places where food is being produced reduces. So uh, when we provide them, uh, so it's uh, called as an empowerment based model for sustainability. What we do is we bring in physical, electronic knowledge and economic connectivity through infrastructure such as roads, railways, educational and medical institutions, communication networks such as wireless networks and broadband connectivity in order to provide the villages with improved access, technical knowledge for improving productivity of village farm and non-farm activities and creating opportunities for economic growth and development through setup of factories, industries and other institutions which are uh, close to the activities which happens in rural areas. So I am not talking about setting up a steel industry over there. But setting up industry, so I will tell you the, show you a video of Varna Pura which will make it more clear like when we want to set up factories, industries and other institutions in rural areas, what kind of uh, we mean. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing more about uh, this particular approach, you can go through this book on target 3 billion. So this is uh, the example Varna Pura. Varna is a district in Karnataka. Varna Valley in Maharashtra. A land of depravity, of poverty, illiteracy and crime. A land that had wasted away in neglect. A people who had little to treasure, but were often robbed of even that. Yet from amidst this gloom, there emerged a few young men. Vishwanath Rao Kore, K.D. Patil, and Yashwant Rao Chauhan, who dreamt of transforming this wasteland into a paradise. These young Turks leapt into the struggle for India's independence. A war the nation was waging on many fronts. The nation was in turmoil. This was a moment of realization for Vishwanath Rao Kore. He returned to his native village, Koduli, to fight the enemies at home first. Young Vishwanath Rao Kore was poised to chart a historic course as he surveyed the expanse of Warana Valley. As his visions crystallized, a movement for renaissance, a revolution was born. He started his crusade with the setting up of Koduli High School. The end of British Raj brought many new freedoms and opportunities for the farmers. Traditionally, the farmers always processed whatever little cane they had into jaggery. If instead cane was made into sugar, it would add value 
and earn more. But the farmers had no means to set up a sugar factory. That's when Vishwanath Rao Kore hit upon an idea. What if the farmers formed a cooperative? Convincing the farmers to be members, telling them of his vision of Varana Valley was not an easy job. But convince he did. He saw strength in togetherness, prosperity in cooperation. Finally, Tatya Sahib, as Vishwanath Rao was by now called, began a cooperative movement for sugarcane farmers. The Warana Cooperative Sugar Factory was set up. This brought dynamism to the once slumberous and arid Warana Valley. Eighty determined villagers, led by Tatya Sahib Kore, crossed all hurdles with perseverance and confidence. The sugar factory grew in size and soon had the largest cane crushing capacity in India. Along with the sugar factory, the farmers of the Warana Cooperative built five dams. The dams improved irrigation facilities and the yield of sugar cane rose dramatically. Sugar brought prosperity and it gave the farmers and their families a new lease of life. Finally, Tatya Saib Gore's dream of a farmer's cooperative was realized. To improve the economic condition of landless laborers of the Warana Valley, Warana Dairy was started as an on-the-side enterprise of the cooperative. The Warana Bank was founded to help the cooperative with financing new ventures. The cooperative bank provided loans necessary for cattle purchasing, etc. The side business flourished and grew rapidly. Today, it is a state-of-the-art milk collecting and processing plant with 3 lakh litres daily capacity. The Warana Cooperative diversified by setting up modern manufacturing units to produce milk products like Shrikham, Ghee, Skim Milk Powder, Lassi, Cheese and Butter. Today, its Shrikham and Lassi are market leaders. The women of Warana Valley joined hands to form Warana Bhagini Mandal and contributed to the revolution. They emancipated themselves from the drudgery of household work. Tatya Saib Gore's vision was to achieve a revolution, economic and intellectual. Thus, Warana Vibhag Shikshan Mandal was born. Schools and colleges, both in humanities and sciences, were set up. Tatya Sahib's battles against poverty and illiteracy were slowly and surely won. The famous Baal Vadya Vrind became the voice of Varana Valley world over. Tatya Sahib Gore Military Academy was founded with the objective of nurturing young boys to become efficient soldiers and citizens of the nation. Men, women and children all have been transformed by it. There was no looking back after that. Other ideas followed. The Warana Cooperative Poultry Farm, an example of a rural enterprise turning even more profitable as a cooperative venture. The Varana Bazaar, chain with branches in all the villages of the cooperative. Bagas, the waste from the sugar factory, was used as raw material to manufacture paper. Warana Distillery, which uses molasses, a byproduct of sugar, to manufacture industrial alcohol. Wargao Agricultural Research Center devising environmentally friendly techniques for better farming. Mahatma Gandhi Hospital, enabling the villagers to easily access the best in health care. The picture of Varana Valley that Tatya Saib Kore had envisioned was a reality for all to see and be inspired by. The vision of Tatya Saib was inherited by his son, Sri Vilas Tata Kore, who envisioned the advent of agro-technologies. His son, the equally dynamic Vinay Kore, Sauka to all in Varana Valley, is carrying forward this vision. Our mission is to enable every man in Varana Valley to take control of his destiny. The need of the R is to amalgamate the goodness and strength of our traditional Indian values and technological achievements of the 21st century. We are determined for the upliftment of every individual 
through the Varna Cooperative Movement. Today in Varana Valley, a revolutionary concept is shaping up. The Varana Wired Village Project, where all the 80 villages will be connected by their own net. A pilot project of the government being implemented here in Varana Nagar. WAPCOS, a state-of-the-art fruit processing factory, was set up with American loans and technology. Clearly, the Warana farmer's word of honor is good enough mortgage for international funds too. In Warana Nagar, every process is integrated, interconnected, interdependent, and completely independent of outside assistance. The new generations in Warana Nagar do not join without rewards. Every farmer in these 80 villages is a shareholder in the hugely successful cooperative story. There is true freedom here. Freedom from poverty. From illiteracy. The renaissance has happened. The vision persists. What the value of hunger and depravity? Warana Nagar is now a paradise. A role model of cooperative success for all to see and be inspired by. So in this example you can see that by providing in infrastructure, strategically providing infrastructure, physical, electronic, knowledge and economic connectivity by connecting uh, infrastructure such as roads, railways, educational, magical institutions, communication networks such as wireless networks and broadband connectivity to the village areas. It improved access, technical knowledge for improving productivity of village farms and non-farm activities and creating opportunities for economic growth and development through setup of related factories, industries and other institutions. So we went through four different types of design for sustainability intervention. In the last intervention which I was speaking about, the uh, situation is something like a socio-economic context. It is a situation which was a developing situation or an underdeveloped situation in which I tried to develop an entire society's economic activities, convert uh, it into a socially, economically and uh, environmentally sustainable uh, region. Took over 8 to 9 decades of hard work and it needs continuous development. This is a kind of a design intervention scenario in a in, uh, underdeveloped or developing in, uh, situation with societal dynamics. Uh, the first example that I was talking about, the Lewis genes, that's kind of an example wherein we do certain design for sustainability activities wherein we know that there is an existing waste stream. There is not much we can in, uh, we can do certain things to avoid the, to reduce the waste stream, but at this moment there is not much which is being done to reduce the waste stream. So let's do a reuse of the waste stream and come up with some design solutions in an industrial context. The second uh, kind of example, the blue economy based example, they are trying to talk about a context in which I am trying to create altogether new ventures. These ventures will be most likely small ventures, not very big ventures, not like multinational companies. Maybe we, no, we do not know, no, no, it might no, happen eventually, but small enterprises, more localized enterprises using uh, processes inspired from the nature, which are physical processes and putting it into a successful business model. The third example that we spoke about, the cradle to cradle, it again comes from industrial context wherein we take up a particular product, strip down it down into components and see how each and every component can either be taken into a biological cycle or a technical uh, cycle. And then uh, introduce this redesigned 
product into the market along with an infrastructure which can enable the collection of the products back so that it can be put into the biological or technical cycle by the company itself or put an infrastructure in place which enables the users to do the same. So in this particular week we studied about what is unsustainability, what do we how do we move towards sustainability, the definition of sustainability, definition of sustainable development and some design approaches on how to achieve it. What we will do next week is taking this uh, today's lecture forward, we will try to see that how these different uh, techniques have evolved through the design history, how these different techniques are applicable in different contexts industrialized context, developing context, developed context, the kind of impact that we want and try to compare them. No one technique is better than the other in terms of absolute ways. There are certain contexts in which we can apply one technique more easily than the other. Hoping to see you back again next week.